Some of you may have attended a year ago a talk that uh, Rose Gottmuller gave uh, on st strategic stability in the second nuclear age, same basic t title as today. Uh, and Rose sc spoke very positively about a piece of work that the Council on Foreign Relations had had, had underway and uh, in a study group on strategic stability that ran for about a year. Uh, Greg had the, the mixed uh, blessing of being the chair of that study group uh, and uh, trying to corral a bunch of cats towards some uh, uncertain destination. But the result was a, a fine uh, study group report and a, a big marker in the thinking of our nation about uh, strategic stability and what, what it means what the, what the main organizing concepts can and should be in a, in a more multipolar, less bipolar security environment of the kind we're, we've moved into. So what Greg's going to do today is uh, s summarize this report and talk a little bit about its, its implications. Uh, by way of introduction, he's a, an associate professor in the School of Public Policy and Government at George Mason University uh, in Virginia. He directs the, uh, he wrote a PhD dissertation on, uh, for at MIT, yeah. at MIT, uh, on uh, bio, biological warfare and biodefense issues, which was uh, subsequently published, uh, a fine piece of work. Uh, and it's uh, led him also to the role as director of the biodefense graduate program uh, at George Mason University. Uh, during uh, the academic year 2012-2013, he was a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow uh, at the Council on Foreign Relations, which is uh, a fellowship from a family foundation that gives uh, 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 the Stanton family was CBS? Yeah. CBS. And um, somehow the family got interested in promoting studies on nuclear deterrence policy uh, and created a series of fellowships. And one of those fellowships brings people out of the academic world to sit at the Council on Foreign Relations for a year uh, and do some good thinking and uh, standing back from the daily press of teaching and uh, grading papers. Uh, and uh, so please join me in welcoming Greg Koblenz this morning. Thank you. Over to you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Brad, and, and thanks to Paris Althaus for uh, arranging this, this invitation. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to talk to you about uh, my report on um, strategic stability in the second nuclear age. Um, I brought these copies all the way from DC, so I don't want to have to take them home. So please, um, when, we're, when we're done, feel free to pick up a, a copy uh, for yourself. Um, let me just start off and let you know that the, the fundamental assumption going into writing this report was that the United States has a vital national interest in preventing the deliberate, accidental, unauthorized use of nuclear weapons. Uh, the U.S. has a, a unique position in the world uh, due to our uh, global leadership position, uh, our global security commitments, our economic interdependence with so many other countries, uh, and our overwhelming conventional military superiority. All those advantages we put at risk if there was a breakdown in strategic stability. So the US benefits disproportionately from efforts to prevent the use of nuclear weapons by anyone, anywhere in the world for any reason. So that's the kind of the fundamental assumption that was driving this report uh, and trying to understand what are the risks to strategic stability uh, today. So um, before um, I, I get into what, what some of the challenges are, I just want to kind of put up front you know, how I define strategic stability, how I define the second nuclear age, uh, since these, the, both these terms are used uh, widely by different people in different countries for different, for different meanings. Uh, the way I conceive of strategic stability is uh, the risk of nuclear weapons uh, being used is low because neither side is incentive to strike first. Both sides are confident they could try second, uh, and they are, to borrow the words of, of Tom Schelling, uh, immune or, or resistant to shocks, alarms, and perturbations. So under these conditions, countries have uh, less reason to escalate a crisis uh, less reason to act rashly or rapidly in uncertain information, uh, less incentive to engage in, uh, in, in arms racing. So under conditions of strategic stability, um, it does not mean that you will not have crises, you will not have conflicts, but the risks of them escalating to the nuclear level are, are greatly reduced. Now, the, the second nuclear age is, is a term that's popularized by people like Colin Gray, uh, Paul Bracken, um, that refers to uh, the change in the nuclear uh, order since the end of the, the Cold War. Uh, we went from a, a, a nuclear order defined by the, the superpowers, by a bipolar distribution of, of nuclear powers, to a multipolar nuclear system. Um, and most notably, you have the rise of uh, new nuclear weapon states in Asia, uh, China, 
India, Pakistan, and now North Korea. Um, China, India, and Pakistan obviously had nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War, uh, but their programs greatly expanded uh, um, since, the, since, that, since that time. Uh, so in contrast to the United States, Russia, France, the United Kingdom, which have been reducing their nuclear weapons stockpiles since the end of the Cold War, in Asia you have a nuclear buildup. Um, and so this is a, a fundamentally different type of, um, of system that we had during the, during the Cold War. Now the important thing here is not the actual absolute number of nuclear weapon states. What's more important is the increasingly complex uh, interaction between them and the increasingly complex deterrence relationships between them. And this leads to the first challenge to strategic stability, uh, what I call the new geometry of deterrence. Uh, Trace Del Pesce calls it the new algebra of deterrence. Pick your mathematical formula. Uh, but th this, is, this is a much more complex situation now than we had during the Cold War. During the Cold War, the uh, United States and Soviet Union worried about the security dilemma. One state's actions to increase their security would reduce another state's uh, security. They would then take a countermeasure that would then reduce the security of the first state. So you have this kind of action-reaction cycle uh, between two states. Now, uh, as you see uh, from this very basic Venn diagram, uh, most nuclear weapon states actually face uh, threats or sources of threats from more than one source, from more than one country. Um, uh, so uh, the United States sees uh, uh, nuclear threats uh, emanating from North Korea, uh, Russia, China, and Pakistan. Uh, Russia also sees, has to worry about uh, threats posed by nuclear weapons in the United Kingdom, France, China, and the United States, and, and et cetera. Um, just to make a note, th th these, these um, circles are not to scale. Um, the, the degree of overlap between the circles is not indicative. This is just a, my crude PowerPoint skills don't let me do anything to scale with this. So, but the overall point of this relationship of that there is overlapping deterrence networks now operating among these different countries is really, uh, is really the key thing. Just to kind of illustrate this uh, with, with some more kind of substance, um, this is a list of, of potential flashpoints among nuclear armed states. This list is not exhaustive. This list is not meant to uh, indicate that any one of these uh, flashpoints will become a military dispute, will escalate to, to nuclear use. Uh, but just to highlight the fact that there are, among nuclear armed dyads, there are multiple areas of, of friction, uh, disputed borders, disputed territory, uh, or areas uh, like in Syria where we have uh, the, the military forces of nuclear armed powers operating in very close proximity. Um, and these flashpoints uh, have the potential to flare up rather unexpectedly. Right, think about um, uh, China's declaration of an air defense identification zone uh, in East China, uh, in the East China Sea in, in 2013. Uh, think about uh, Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea uh, in the span of a week in February 2014. Right, so these flashpoints, which are kind of similar, which are existing, can flare up rather, rather suddenly. And these flashpoints can also uh, escalate unanticipated ways. Um, in, in July 2014, uh, when a uh, Russian surface air missile uh, shot down a, a Malaysian airliner over, um, over Ukraine. Um, I was actually in the middle of one of the meetings putting together this report with, with other folks from, from the, kind of the think tank and policy communities in, in DC. And you know, one of the thoughts that nearly flashed my, my, through my head was, what if this had been American Airlines jet instead of a Malaysian Airlines jet? How would that have changed uh, the, um, the crisis over, over Ukraine uh, if you'd had uh, you know, a, a, a miscalculation of that, of that magnitude? directly affecting, you know, killing 300 Americans instead of uh, uh, people from, from Europe and, and Malaysia. So um, there are, um, you know, geopolitics is still, still around, still matters, um, and there are, there are issues between uh, these states that um, could generate um, uh, crises and conflicts in, in the future. Now this leads to the second uh, major uh, challenge to, to strategic stability, uh, which is what I call the security trilemma. Um, because states face threats from more than one source, uh, there's potential for a country to take actions designed to deter one state, but that inadvertently threatens a third state. Um, and that third state then takes, responds in a way that reduces the security of the original state. Right? Even though that was not intended, they were not the target of the deterrent action, and yet they find that they are now caught in a kind of tri tri triangular relationship. Um, this, this security trilemma helps explain uh, Russian uh, responses to um, uh, U.S. missile defenses in Europe, right, which are designed, aimed for um, defending against uh, Iranian missiles, and yet Russia perceives that there's a threat to their own forces. Likewise, 
Chinese uh, concerns about US national missile defense, which are designed for small scale North Korean uh, uh, missile threats, or the deployment of THAAD to South Korea generates a very strong response in, in Beijing. So you have this, um, this, this trilateral dynamic going on where actions taken by one state to deter a second state uh, wind up actually reducing the security of a third state. And because these countries have these, uh, these interconnected deterrence relationships, it's, um, these security trilemma can act like a transmission belt. And issues that would once have been a bilateral security dilemma between two states get uh, a much wider scope. Right? So instead of that being a US North Korean bilateral issue, right now it's, it's directly impinging on, or the Chinese say it's directly impinging on their own, their own security. Uh, you see this, this um, uh, trilateral uh, triangular relationship, uh, particularly uh, problematic in, in South Asia, um, where uh, actions that China's taking, for example, um, for their testing of, of anti-satellite weapons, which was, um, uh, you know, was motivated by uh, concerns uh, over uh, competition with the US, Chinese anti-satellite testing has now spurred India to launch its own program. Uh, we now, uh, recently China announced that they were moving, uh, or the US assessed they, they were moving some of their ICBMs, right, in, in large part in order to penetrate US national missile defenses. Uh, that's providing India now uh, with a higher incentive to, to put MIRVs on their own missiles. They've talked about wanting to do that for a while, they haven't. Now what, with China doing this, this is a potential to uh, spur greater Indian action. If the Indians MIRV, then Pakistan will likely feel compelled to take countermeasures. Um, and so you have this, uh, this, this cascading effect that the, tri the security um, trilemma causes uh, that takes what would have been otherwise you know, contained bilateral uh, issues and makes them uh, have a much broader regional scope. Um, if you take a look also, uh, for example, at, at India's relationship wedged in between Pakistan and, and China, uh, India's nuclear doctrine it actually faces a paradox. They claim they have a credible minimum deterrent doctrine. The problem is um, that their uh, deterrent, if it's uh, credible towards China, will not be minimum towards Pakistan. And if it's minimum towards uh, Pakistan, right, it won't be credible towards China. Uh, and so they have a, a hard time squaring that circle. And for, for India, they're much more focused on the Chinese nuclear and, and missile threat. Um, they see them as their peer competitor, uh, as, as worthy, you know, another great power who they are, they're competing with. Um, and yet that makes Pakistan feel even, even more insecure. Um, and so this, again, this cre creates a very unstable relationship that makes it much more likely that outside events can um, have an impact within South Asia and destabilize it, or events within South Asia, within, you know, uh, uh, particularly in India, will have knock-on effects in China, which then might affect um, uh, Chinese uh, deterrence relationships with, with other countries. Uh, so this, this becomes a much more complex uh, environment where the, the changes in, in doctrine are postured by one country has the potential to have this cascading effect, a ripple effect, on other countries in the system. Uh, and, and during the Cold War, that really wasn't the case. It really was uh, competition dominated by the United States and Soviet Union because our nuclear forces were, were just so much larger than everyone else's. Um, you didn't have this, this as tight of a coupling uh, as we see today. Um, the, second, um, uh, the second area of, uh, of challenge that we see is that uh, unlike the, the Cold War when nuclear forces uh, were the, um, the prime means of, of determining what is the, the, delicate, balance of, of, um, the delicate balance of terror, right, there are now new, um, new technologies that have emerged, new non-nuclear technologies that have the potential to, to tilt that balance one way or the other. So you have new uh, technologies like ballistic missile defense, long-range precision strike, and satellite weapons and, and cyber weapons that have the potential to either replicate, offset, or mitigate the effects of nuclear weapons. Um, some of these are, are more near-term concerns, right? Some are a little bit longer-term uh, concerns. Uh, but each of these uh, technologies has the potential to upset some part of strategic stability that we've, we've been talking about. So to go back to the way that uh, strategic stability has been uh, conceived of by, by people like, like Tom Schelling, um, when you have certain configurations of, of forces or systems, right, th these, are, these are sources of instability. So when your nuclear forces are vulnerable to an attack, uh, when you have unreliable uh, uh, early warning systems, when you have unreliable command and control systems, um, uh, when uh, weapons are, are accident prone or weapons rely on surprise for their effectiveness, um, these are all uh, ingredients for instability that will change the calculus for countries to determine whether or not they need to use these weapons first in a crisis uh, or if they can um, uh, be more uh, methodical and, and careful 
uh, with their with their decision making. Um, so just provide a couple of, of examples uh, of this. Um, during the, the first nuclear age, um, nuclear weapons were the only weapons capable of destroying other nuclear weapons. Um, because of the uncertainty of target locations, uh, the distances involved, the hardness of the targets, right, nuclear weapons were the only feasible means of conducting counterforce. Uh, thanks to the revolution in, in precision guided munitions, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance uh, capabilities, uh, there's now the potential for conventional weapons to perform that counterforce role. Uh, the US started developing these capabilities as a way of going after you know, hardened, buried, deep targets as a way to um, not need to use nuclear weapons to go after those, those targets. Uh, so it was, a, it was a, seen as a way of reducing our reliance on nuclear weapons to go after certain classes of targets. But paradoxically, because the US now has such a uh, overwhelming asymmetric advantage in these long range conventional precision strike systems, it's making other countries less uh, uh, likely to reduce their reliance on nuclear weapons. Uh, and particularly a combination of conventional, what's called conventional counterforce and missile defenses uh, creates concerns in, in, you know, in Moscow and Beijing uh, that uh, the US is putting itself in a position to be able to uh, conduct a disarming first strike, neutralize uh, a country's nuclear forces without actually using nuclear weapons. Um, and particularly in, in China, this is reportedly one of the, 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 the concerns that's, that's driving the debate within the, the Chinese military about whether or not they should still have a, new, a, new, a no first use doctrine. Right? This has been long-standing Chinese strategy doctrine since 1964, not be the first use nuclear weapons. Right? There's been in the last couple of years more talk about whether or not the Chinese are still uh, strictly adhering to that and, and whether they will in, in the future. And again, if China changes their, their doctrine, Right? Um, that is not just a matter of a US-Chinese um, uh, deterrence, right? that will also affect uh, India. Right? And likewise, if that changes India's nuclear posture, right, that could also have a knock-on effect on, on Pakistan as well. Um, so these, these are all, these are all inter interconnected. Uh, the newest uh, um, danger to strategic stability in, in this category, I think, are cyber weapons. Um, this is obviously one of the more kind of longer-term challenges, but based on what we've seen about you know, existing capabilities, projected capabilities, this is a major source of concern. Uh, let me just highlight two, uh, two or three potential uh, areas of concern. One is the ability of, of cyber weapons to spoof or jam early warning systems. Uh, there's a report that when Israel uh, uh, attacked the reactor in, in Syria back in 2007, uh, they used a cyber weapon to knock out Syrian air defenses, basically to blind them. Um, uh, if that becomes a, a capability that uh, makes countries unable to rely on the early warning sensors for detecting an attack. Um, you know, th that, has, that has implications for whether or not they think they can you know, detect the surprise attack at a time or, or not. Um, uh, there's also the potential for countries to use this kind of technique to um, you know, engage in what's called a false flag operation. Make a country think something's happening when it's really not. Uh, we haven't seen a, a direct example of that, but there was an analogous case in 1998 um, after India tested its nuclear weapons, the ISI, the Pakistan intelligence agencies, told Prime Minister Sharif that there was an Israeli airstrike incoming and that Pakistan had a test now before, uh, before the Israelis arrived. Uh, that report was totally spurious. Uh, it, it was made up by ISI to uh, put pressure on the Pakistani leadership, right? But, uh, and, it, and it didn't work because they, they called us and then we called the Israelis and we kind of sorted it out. But that, that potential for using um, cyber operations to create false perceptions of what other countries are doing uh, is, is real. Um, there's also the potential for uh, cyber weapons to uh, be used to disrupt command and control systems, right? To, to, de to digitally decapitate a nation's leadership from their nuclear forces. Um, the US, um, uh, there's, there's a long uh, history of, of um, back in, in the 1980s, the US explored that kind of option uh, with the Soviet Union. Um, nothing came of it, but that, that idea that that's possible or that's feasible or it's desirable was, was planted. Um, and um, we've seen um, uh, uh, new um, examples of this with, um, uh, there've been recent reports about uh, DOD and, and NSA developing cyber weapons for what's called left of launch missile defense. Uh, finding ways to hack into computers of missile launch units in North Korea or other countries that could either provide early warning of, of a launch, uh, shut down the launch, or somehow sabotage the launch and, and the missile. Um, so this is, this is not just a kind of hypothetical um, you know, science fiction scenario. This, this is something that, that, that is being you know, thought about seriously and, and, and planned on. 
Um, the problem is, if you start creating distrust uh, uh, for a country within its own command and control system, they won't be able to control the nuclear forces, whether either giving positive commands or negative commands. Um, this, this, is, this, is, this is poisonous. Right? This, this is not just about infecting malware into a computer. This is infecting decision makers with doubt and uncertainty uh, and creating potential for, for miscalculation, uh, for rush judgments. Uh, and you know, in the extreme cases, uh, if a country thought that they were going to lose control of the ability to launch an attack, even in retaliation, uh, because they thought their command control system had been compromised, how are they going to respond? Right? What are they going to do in, the, in that situation? During the Cold War, the United States and Soviet Union use lots of strategies to mitigate the effects of, of a surprise attack. Uh, you know, launch on warning, pre-delegation, um, you know, keeping uh, nuclear forces at very high levels of alert. Uh, the Soviets even automated you know, part of their retaliatory system. Um, we don't know how states are going to respond. Right? Cyber weapons are a very novel, uh, a novel threat. Uh, we're still not, you know, the capabilities are still developing. We don't know how countries are going to necessarily respond to them. How we respond, the Chinese, the Russians, right, is going gonna, is gonna to vary. And that creates uh, a, a lot of unpredictability and uncertainty that, 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 is, is, that is worrisome. Um, and we've seen some kind of you know, uh, analogous uh, 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 cases of this, of this happen. Uh, not intentional, right, but, but accidental acts, but that show you the potential of what could happen. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, the Air Force lost contact with 50 ICBMs. Um, one of the launch control centers started giving out kind of um, uh, uh, bad signals, and they had to shut down the entire, uh, the entire squadron in order to figure out what was going on. Uh, and this was peacetime that they were sitting down and they figured out. What has happened during, during a crisis, when suddenly you know, a, a chunk of the US ICBM force goes offline, and people don't know why? And in the middle of the crisis with China, with Russia, with whoever, again, that creates that, uh, you know, that, that level of uncertainty that this might be the, the prelude to a cyber attack. Is this the beginning of, of someone trying to disrupt our command and control? Is this the prelude to a preemptive attack? And, and what do you do? How do you respond? Um, and these kind of things we don't want to be improvised responses to in the middle of a, of a crisis. OK. Um, so uh, in, in addition to the, to the specific challenges that some of these technologies pose for strategic stability, right, so some of which are, are we're seeing now, others are you know, more long term. Um, there are a number of challenges to trying to assess what the impact of these new emerging technologies are. Uh, the first one is these technologies are advancing very rapidly, right? much more rapidly than, than missile technology, than, than war technology. Um, uh, and, and this rapid advance uh, makes it much harder for states to accurately assess the capabilities of their uh, adversaries or of other states. Uh, and this creates potential for worst case analyses uh, and feeds into the zero sum mentality that you see with the security trilemma. Right? And particularly for, for militaries right, who are you know, paid to do worst case assessments, paid to, uh, uh, paid to uh, um, you know, take a, as much precautions as they can, um, you see them uh, you know, extrapolating, well, if this is possible now, what might be possible later? Therefore, what do we need to do now to get ahead of the curve? Um, and so this creates the dynamic, the potential dynamic for arms racing among these different, these different technologies. Um, you also, um, uh, because you now are seeing interactions between nuclear, cyber, conventional uh, and, and satellite um, capabilities, you're, you, what, what people are calling cross-domain linkages. Right? And these create new challenges. Right? How do you, uh, if you want to deter uh, an act in the nuclear realm using cyber means, how do you calibrate that? How do you use a, a, a capability that, all these capabilities have different utility for deterrence, war fighting, coercion, um, assurance, um, and calibrating what, which of these is, a, is applicable uh, in, in which domain is, is a challenge. Um, how do you determine what is a proportionate and discriminate cyber response to an event in the space domain? Um, right, th these are, these are you know, fundamental questions that people are still trying to, uh, trying to, to grapple with. Um, and um, what makes this even harder to, to get at is um, it's not just one of these technologies operating independently, it's the cumulative impact of these technologies operating together. I mentioned earlier the idea of you know, count conventional counterforce and ballistic missile defense being seen as, as a combined threat. Now if you're adding in cyber operations as a, a left of launch missile defense strategy, you now have, you know, again, two or three technologies that are interacting in ways that are um, affecting a country's uh, perceived ability for their nuclear forces to either survive a first strike or be able to conduct uh, an assured retaliatory uh, second strike. Um, and the ability of governments to figure this out is, is impeded by the fact that many of these capabilities are being developed by different parts of the government, 
different organizations are developing these technologies for different purposes. Uh, so you have stove piping, you have fragmentation, uh, and so this makes it much harder to have that, that cumulative net assessment of how these technologies might affect strategic stability vis-a-vis -vis one country uh, or another. Um, uh, and part of the reason for this is that some of these technologies, especially cyber, conventional counterforce, are not being developed for their applications in the nuclear realm. They're being developed because they have uh, utility for conventional war fighting or even for, for counterterrorism. So you have uh, organizations developing these capabilities right, for, you know, for, for other types of missions, but then they have applicability to, uh, uh, to, the, um, to the nuclear domain as well. Uh, but this makes it much harder when these capabilities get much more widespread. It makes it much harder to kind of draw a bright line between capabilities that are, uh, will affect strategic stability and, and ones that will not. Uh, especially if you look at things like um, you know, long, you know, cruise missiles, um, long range precision strike weapons that are designed to you know, enhance you know, war fighting uh, and, and going after um, conventional targets. Um, but as those capabilities increase, uh, you know, uh, developing cruise missiles with um, uh, 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 you know, penetrating warheads, uh, cruise missiles that are retargetable and can, uh, in flight you can um, uh, you know, go after road mobile targets, right? That then starts having application not just for uh, conventional war fighting, but also for going after uh, nuclear forces as well. Um, and, and finally, um, we see that the impact of these technologies, again, some of these are, are near term, some are long term, but they are going to increase. Um, this is a very dynamic environment. Um, we're going to see uh, capabilities emerge that um, are, are going to be su surprising, um, and, um, and, and they're going to proliferate. Um, especially cyber uh, is, is not, um, cyber has, has a huge potential to be developed by, by actors that have a, it's much lower barriers of entry to, to dealing, developing cyber capabilities than there are developing long range precision strike capabilities. Um, and as, if and when, United States, other countries um, get to the point where we are ready to reduce our nuclear forces even further, these technologies become more, even more important um, in terms of what, how do they change the balance uh, of power? How do they change the, the strategic stability among these forces? So we're going to be entering a period where these technologies will become increasingly important and they might, when that intersects with our desire to reduce nuclear forces, we're going to come to an inflection point. Um, and um, to the extent that that is then taken on as, okay, uh, as, as part of a, uh, a arms reduction um, process in the future, you're going to run into verification issues, right? The U.S. And, and, you know, and others work very hard on how do you verify strategic launchers, how do you verify warheads, um, things like cyber, conventional counterforce. I mean, there are huge verification challenges um, that are going to be that are going to be posed by these that, that we're not, I don't think, really addressing now because we're not thinking about these things in arms control context. Um, but we, we're going to have to in, in the future. So. Uh, I think there's a need to get ahead of the curve on, on some of these technologies, their impact on strategic stability, and how you're going to try and mitigate that impact down the line. So let me um, leave you with a, just a couple of, of areas that I think um, uh, warrant uh, further um, uh, discussion. Uh, there are um, 10 pages of policy prescriptions in here, so I'm not going to bore you with, with all of them. I just want to highlight these two. Uh, in part because I think there's a lot of work that needs to get done to figure out how to make them operational. So I'd love to have uh, hear feedback um, uh, from everyone here uh, about this. Um, the first area is, is cyber. And like I said, I think this is the, the technology that is kind of the most uh, long-term concern for uh, strategic stability. You know, it's not that I'm worried about hi uh, hackers hijacking someone's nuclear arsenal or starting World War III with a, with a, a computer virus. Um, it's this much more insidious effect of, of how will uh, aggressive cyber operations uh, you know, either known or feared cyber capabilities uh, affect decision makers' confidence in their own ability to control uh, their nuclear forces or detect an attack or know that there is no attack underway. Um, and, and, and it's that combination of, um, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, um, uncertainty and, and doubt and suspicion that is the, is the last thing you want to have during a U.S. Russian, U.S. Chinese, Indo Pakistani crisis or, or confrontation. Uh, when countries can, cannot, you know, are, are, are wondering, do I have a logic bomb in my command and control system that's going to prevent me from being able to uh, communicate effectively with my forces in the event of a crisis or an escalation? Uh, that, that level of uncertainty uh, and, and, and doubt uh, does not bode well for, for rational uh, uh, decision making under these kinds of, under these kinds of conditions. Um, you know, th there are people have talked about kind of, you know, the benefits of this, and, and you know, there might be some short-term tactical benefits to be able to knocking out 
uh, a country's you know, uh, leadership's ability to communicate with the nuclear forces, right? but the strategic consequences, I think, are, are, are much higher and, and more severe. Uh, Richard Danzig calls this MUD, mutual unassured destruction. Right? And that, just, that raises a whole host of questions about what will countries do if they are confronted with that situation, if they think this is the reality they're living in, how are they going to act in a, in a world of mud? Um, and part of it, we, we don't know yet. And uh, by the same time, I, I, I don't see lots of good answers coming out of that, out of that situation. Um, so from my perspective, right, it's in the interest of the nuclear weapon states to make sure that all nuclear countries have effective command and control over safe, secure nuclear weapons. We don't want to be undermining and uh, that either you know, intentionally, and we don't want third parties doing that to one another uh, either. This is when, you know, kind of one of those, these, these public goods that everyone's better off if every country that has nuclear weapons maintains you know, very firm control over them um, uh, uh, without, uh, um, uh, without, without interference. Um, uh, again, and, and so, one, so one of the things I've, I've suggested um, is uh, the, the nuclear weapon states agree with what amongst themselves not to target each other's nuclear force or the cyber weapon, <coughs> including command and control earning early warning systems. Basically take that off the table, uh, draw a red line the way we have with things like uh, corporate espionage uh, and say that th these, are, th these, are, these are areas that, we're, that are not, not acceptable. Um, lots of hurdles to get that done. Uh, we've taken some small steps to do that. Uh, the U.S. and Russia uh, have opened up a channel using the nuclear risk communication centers. Uh, to report cyber incidents of national security significance. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping has uh, you know, pledged uh, you know, that China will not support state-sponsored uh, corporate espionage. Uh, so you know, th there is possibly the creating rules of the road in, in cyberspace. And, and I think there are a couple of areas where uh, you know, I think it, it's to our benefit uh, to draw some, some bright lines and, and try and, and make them stick. Um, uh, the second um, uh, big policy recognition, uh, which has a couple different facets to it, but it comes down to in bringing uh, India and Pakistan into, um, into the strategic stability dialogue. Um, since the, the late 2000s, the US has been talking with the other P5 nuclear weapon states about strategic stability, uh, which has had a, been, been a useful way to engage China in, in arms control discussions that, that they haven't been privy to before. Uh, because China, India, and Pakistan have come up, uh, have, have emerged as nuclear weapon states without any of the regimes, institutions, you know, mechanisms that that the United States and Soviet Union and, and Russia developed over the years to try and, and modulate and moderate uh, their strategic competition. Um, and so I think there's, there's a, a much greater need now to engage these countries in these kind of discussions, to build up their internal capacities to engage in these types of, of dialogues uh, and try and um, uh, use those kinds of, of, of uh, uh, forum to, um, to address some of the issues that are kind of festering in, in uh, Indo-Pakistani uh, uh, relations. We, we've, there's been a, a nuclear missile arms race going on in South Asia since 1998. Uh, that's gotten virtually no uh, international attention. Um, very few efforts by uh, the U.S. to actually uh, uh, try and slow down or halt or, or um, uh, contain that, uh, that competition. Um, and now we see um, you know, nuclear weapons being developed, you know, tactical nuclear weapons, submarine launched ballistic missiles, ship launched ballistic missiles that in, uh, create a, a whole host of new safety and security concerns, command and control concerns in South Asia, where um, I think these are these are new risks that we can least afford in this in this very volatile region. Um, so again, this is just a, a, an overview of of some of the, the recommendations. Um, would uh, you know appreciate? Please um, take a copy. Don't make me bring these things back to DC. And uh, uh, thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions. <laughs>